Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today I would like to speak to you about true conversion, what it is and what it is not. Many people believe that they're converted. They believe they have a hope of going to heaven when they die, but they're not sure. They're not positive, even though they may have gone through Bible school or seminary. Many people do not have this assurance in their hearts. And so I want to talk about true conversion, what it is and what it is not. This is the most important thing. There's nothing more important in life than to know that you're saved, that Christ is your Lord and Savior, that you have a home with him, and that you are a son of God, a daughter of God. The Bible says, what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So it is natural, normal, to feel good about oneself. We must realize that self-righteousness is the religion of the world. Everybody has some excuse from Adam and Eve when they had excuses and blamed one another and blamed God. So we don't want to give up our pet sins. We don't want to change. And so it takes the power of the Holy Spirit using the Word of God to break through the opposition, the stubbornness, the rebellion, the obstinance in our hearts, because most people are hanging on to their personal lives and don't want God to interrupt them. The Bible said the light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Jesus said, this is the condemnation. First of all, he gave that wonderful scripture we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then he said, this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Now, light means truth, is revelation. And if you're converted, if you're truly converted, you're born again by the Spirit, by truth made effective by the Holy Spirit. Truth made effective by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the true life. Now, what was our state before we came to Christ? And it's interesting to note, before I read Ephesians 2, that the great awakenings in the past all began in church, beginning with the Reformers and Martin Luther in Germany and Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and the Wesleys, all these other great men of God, Charles Finney and so forth. They all began their revival meetings of the, the awakening in church. That means that people who thought they were Christians suddenly realized that they were not. And so this is important now with this third or fourth generation from the Great Awakenings, that people that think they're believers and think that they have been born again because they go to church and they follow certain rules and don't do anything openly wrong, they, they feel that they're saved. And of course, ministers, many ministers, to keep the church filled, to pay the bills, have to make people feel comfortable. But the Bible says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, talking about the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world, the unbeliever, cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, talking to his disciples, for he dwelleth with you, lives with you, and shall be in you. And then he said, Now I go my way to him that sent me. None of you ask, Where are you going? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, talking about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, what is he going to do? What is the Holy Spirit doing? He said, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. That word reprove can be translated convict. 
or he reveals our hearts. He will reprove men of sin, and that sin, of course, is unbelief, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. That means that Jesus is what is right and wrong. He shows us what is right and what is righteous and what is unrighteous. And so the Holy Spirit is to show us what's right and what's not right. And then he says, of judgment, because the prince of this world, the devil, is judged. So most people don't want to hear about judgment. They want to know about heaven. But I want, I want to make it very clear what true conversion is. It is really, the Bible speaks of, of repentance. You know, we talk much about being born again, but Jesus only mentioned that once, and uh, John the Baptist didn't talk about that, and the disciples, Peter mentioned it possibly once. But what the Bible speaks about is repentance. That means to turn, to change, to give up our sin, to walk in holiness. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, what is the state of the unrepentant? What is the state of the unbeliever? Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 2, and he says this, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked or lived according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is speaking of the devil, the spirit, the demonic spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So when we are disobedient to God, we're under the influence of this demonic power. Now, Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. So you need to search for it. It is a narrow way. Jesus didn't say it would be an easy way. He said few, he said few would be that find it. And uh, Paul continues in Ephesians 2, he says, among whom also we all had our conversation or manner of life in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he has loved us, even where we, when we were dead, in trespasses and sin, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ, resurrected with Christ, and made us alive, and by grace we are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So our state before being born of the Spirit was we were dead uh, in trespasses and sins. Now, a dead person is not responsive. A dead person doesn't eat, he has no hunger, he's not thirsty, and he does not communicate. And so if a person is spiritually dead, he only talks about natural things, carnal things, worldly things. He's not hungry for the Word of God, for reading the Word, for studying the Word. He's not thirsting for the Holy Spirit. For Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And so there are many people in church who believe that they're born again, believe they're saved because they had some experience, but are not bringing forth fruit. And so becoming fruitful is part of conversion. Now, I would like to take this step by step and see how God works in us to bring us to that place of conversion. First, he brings conviction. He reproves of sin. He makes us feel how far we are from the Lord. It makes us feel that we need God. Sometimes we feel very bad about it. And this is called remorse for sin. We feel sinful. We feel unclean. And God uses the Word of God. He uses His, His light, the light of the Holy Spirit, to bring us to that place of conviction or remorse, or He reproves us of sin. And so, if we really repent, because instead of preaching uh, be born again, 
the apostle Peter said, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So repentance is extremely important and it means to turn around, to change, to change our direction. We can't choose our destiny. We can only choose the road that we walk on. And so the destiny depends on which way we are going. If we take God's side, then we're going to be with God. But if we take the world's side, we're going to be with the world. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us, reproves us of sin. And if we repent, then we go into this second stage after repentance, uh, and that is conviction of sin. And, And if we yield to the Holy Spirit and start believing, we are converted. But Some people are convinced, but they're not converted. I'm using the letter C to help us to remember. So we're convicted of sin, but not necessarily converted. We may be convinced of sin, and we may be convinced that the way of God is true. We may believe that the Bible is true. We may believe that Jesus died for us and for our sins and rose again for our justification, that he's coming back again. We may believe everything in the Bible— but not necessarily willing to be converted, not necessarily willing to pay the price. Like the rich young ruler, uh, Jesus uh, told him what he needed to do because he felt that he lacked something. And he said, what must I do? And Jesus told him, sell what you have, give to the poor, and take up your cross and follow me. And he went away sad. He didn't have the joy of the Lord because he couldn't give up certain things. And so even though we may be convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for us on the cross, that he rose again the third day, that he was resurrected, that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father praying for us. We may believe all these facts, but not really willing to take up our cross, not really willing to give up certain things for the Lord and become his disciple. Jesus said, unless a man deny himself, he cannot be my disciple. So there's a price to pay. So first we have the conviction of sin, then a person is convinced, but he's still not converted because I'm convinced that that my neighbor has a better pickup truck than I have, but I'm not willing to pay that kind of a price. So you may be convinced of the truth, but not truly converted. But if when you're converted, you turn around, you change, because the scripture says in the Old Testament that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who shall know it? And so but God promises, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, and I will give you my spirit. And this is extremely important that we have a new heart and a new spirit and the Holy Spirit in our hearts that we may walk in the path of the Lord. And so you may be convicted, you may be convinced, but are you converted? That means turned around, changed. And if you're converted, and then it's important that you confess Christ. The scripture says that we believe in our heart on the Lord Jesus and we confess him with our mouth. So it's extremely important if you are alive that you confess not only in church, not only when you're baptized in water, but the Bible says, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, I will be ashamed of you before my Father and the holy angels. And so we must confess him and not be ashamed of him before our friends, before our school friends, before people that we work with or our family. Sometimes it's very difficult to confess Christ before our family members, but we need to confess him. And after we confess him, we must be committed to him, not only confess him, but consecrated. That's another C, to be committed to the lordship of Jesus Christ, to be consecrated. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, in Romans 12, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And so it's extremely important that we be 
consecrated. We be committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and consecrated to our purposes in life to believe and to spread his word, to bring his gospel to the end of the world. And of course, if we're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and we're consecrated to him, then the scripture says that we will be fruitful. We will be fruitful. Jesus said, any branch in me, he was talking about Christians, any branch in me that is not bringing forth fruit will be cut off. And so it's extremely necessary that when the seed of the word of God falls in your heart, it falls in good ground, ground that is broken, that is broken by repentance, turned over, and that that seed is received by faith. The apostle Peter said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. And so it's extremely important that that seed finds place in your heart, not on stony ground and not on ground that has very little depth, because sometimes the seed falls on a ground that has so little depth and when persecution comes and difficulties come, they back out and move away. And then, of course, the seed of the word sometimes fall where there's thorns and thistles. That means things of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the things of the world that would choke out the word of God, and the word is unfruitful, but only one in four falls on good ground. So it's extremely important that you and I receive the word of God with joy and that we bear fruit. And the end word, I would, the, the last word I would say now would be that we continue. We continue in well-doing, not simply begin, but we continue holding steadfast. The Bible said we are partakers of Christ if we hold fast our confidence steadfast to the end. So we must hold steady, hold fast, and be faithful unto the end. Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. And so where are you in this process? It may take a, a week, it may take a day, it may take an hour, but we're convicted, and we're convinced, and then we're converted, and then we confessed our, the Lordship of Jesus Christ with our mouth, and there we're committed, and then we're consecrated to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we continue in communion with the Lord, in fellowship with him. The Bible said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, in communion, and in prayer. So it's extremely important that we have fellowship with our brethren and fellowship with the Lord, a daily experience with him. If we are alive, we're going to be hungry for the word. If we're alive, we're going to be thirsty for the word. And remember what I said in the beginning, that the great revivals, the great awakenings began in church. And most people, most of us don't want uh, the light to be shining in our eyes if we're comfortably sleeping. We would say, take that light away, turn that light off. But the light of God's word will awaken us to say, I am not where I should be. I am not sure about my conversion, about my born again experience. And I want to commit my life to the Lordship of Christ. And I want to follow him all the way. And so now we need another great awakening, another time when the church of Jesus Christ is awakened and realizes how far we have slipped from the path and how far we've slipped from the New Testament model. And God now, through this message, is awakening so many of you. I would love to hear from you and to hear what the Lord is doing and has done in your heart. But I'm going to close now in prayer. And if you are that person that you're not sure, you're not completely committed to the Lordship of Christ, you're not positive. Maybe you received a lot of false comfort, people telling you, oh, just repeat this prayer, say this prayer after me, and uh, I believe you're converted. That is not true. It is the Holy Spirit that tells us, that gives us that confidence that we are 
born of the Holy Spirit. That's extremely important. No one has a right to tell you you're saved. It's the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, because you are sons, this is in Galatians chapter 4, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, or Papa. It's the Holy Spirit that bears witness. And we have in Romans chapter 8, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear judgment or to fear anything, but you have received the spirit of adoption. That's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's how we know. That's how we can be sure. The Bible said, he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Again, the scripture says in Romans 8, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Is that true in your situation? Is the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit? Do you have fellowship with God? Do you love the Lord with all your heart? Do you love his word? Do you love his spirit? Do you love his presence? Do you, do you love the fellowship of the believers? Do you have that assurance? You can have that assurance now. The Bible said, he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the Son of the living God. Do you believe? Have you, are, have you confessed Christ to your friends? Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? Are you willing to be his servant, to be his disciple? And make that choice now. Maybe if you have it up to now, you can do it now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him with all your heart. Turn from anything that is displeasing to God and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want your seed in my heart that I may be born of the Spirit, that I may be a son or daughter of the living God. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray for all those that are hearing this word that you will bring conviction where it's necessary, that you will bring light where it's necessary, that you will cause your word to be as a sword of the Spirit that cuts through our conscience and awakes our conscience, that we may realize our state before you. And I pray for each one that is not sure of their conversion, that at this moment, Father, they will open their heart to your truth, to your word, and to your spirit, and receive Christ in their hearts, and be willing to confess them with their mouth. I pray, Lord, that conviction will come upon those that are walking in sin, conviction of sin, and conviction of judgment. For the word of God says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. May they accept that gift and turn away from self and follow you with all their hearts. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus, that everyone listening to the sound of my voice will turn to Christ at this moment and become one of his disciples one of his sons and one of his daughters. And I pray that the Holy Spirit in his heart will, will rise up and call him Father. Thank you, Father. You're my Father. I accept you as my Father. And I want to walk with you as your son and as your daughter in the precious name of Jesus. And I believe on the Lord with all my heart from this moment on, I will walk with him in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you and let me hear from you so I know what the Lord has done in your life. Mm -hmm.